Hello and welcome to People's Dispatch. Today we are going to talk about the COVID-19 situation in South Africa, especially on the workers and the poor. And to talk about this, we have with us Phaka Malehlubi Majola, the national spokesperson of the National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa. Thank you so much, Pax, for joining us. Thank you and good afternoon or good morning to your listeners, <laughs> your viewers. <laughs> right. Thank you. So, uh, first of all, yesterday night, we understand that the president announced that the lockdown would be extended by a uh, couple of more weeks till the end of April. So, could you first uh, tell us what the situation is with the COVID-19 spread in South Africa, uh, with the numbers and what has been the pattern so far? Well, um, yes, indeed. Yesterday, the president made an announcement that the lockdown, which was only supposed to be 21 days, would now be extended by an additional two weeks. Mm -hmm. So it would basically go on until the end of the month. Um, the reason this is, is because where we are as South Africa in terms of the infection rate, we have over 1,900 cases. Um, and so far, unfortunately, 19 people have passed away. Um, and I think where the concerns are coming from is because the testing process itself has been very, very slow. When we began rolling out the COVID-19 response, um, the expectation had been that we would get to a point where we were testing about 36,000 people a day, and we are nowhere near that. Right. And I think so that's where the concern is coming from, from government, that to say that if we are too quick to lift the lockdown, then we might, you know, the numbers that we're looking at are not really a true reflection of what is actually happening. They've not had enough time, for example, to roll out the mass screening. Um, th this process was actually announced last week, Sunday, but even on that process, they've not gone f far enough. They've not begun doing enough areas. My understanding is they've so far only done a handful of areas. So it's all of those types of concerns that have sparked um, government's response to extend the lockdown because there is a very um, a, a deep concern that the infection is far worse than what we're dealing with. And also, uh, it does seem that on the side of government, they want to do everything to ensure that they, they flatten the curve, right. as they say, of the infection rate. Right. So, uh, the lockdown, as in many places in the global south, has brought a very serious set of socioeconomic concerns as well. And South Africa, with a very high inequality rate, a considerable amount of, say, a massive exploitation in terms of workers, the lack of uh, workers' rights, like as far as workers are concerned, it's been a huge issue. So could you talk a bit about what NUMSA specifically has been raising at this point with regards to the various sectors of the economy? What are the key areas that where workers are facing problems during the lockdown? Well, um, you know, the, the, the problem with the coronavirus is that it, it does seem that the only method of being able to effectively tackle it involves mass quarantines or lockdowns. Um, and, and where basically production has to stop in order to, to take, tackle it effectively. We've seen this in China, we're seeing what Italy is trying to do and all these other countries where um, the virus has, has overtaken them. So um, our problem is that whilst we recognize that the lockdown is necessary in order to curb the spread of the virus, we're deeply concerned that the me this, these measures are having a very detrimental impact on the working class and the poor because our socioeconomic setup is not um, is, is, is not set up in such a way as to support the poor and the working class during a lockdown of this kind. We have extremely high levels of poverty and unemployment. We've got um, unemployment rate that's uh, above 37% now. We've got uh, poverty levels where we're talking more than half the population is poor. Um, and, you know, so, and the majority of workers who are working earn very low wages. Right. So <clears throat> it, it does mean that when you implement a lockdown of this kind, um, it creates real problems. In our case, many companies have obviously taken a decision to lock down because many sectors are not operating 
And what some companies have done is they've gone as far as forcing workers to take a no work, no pay. They've implemented no work, no pay policies. And this for us is particularly problematic because our government has actually gone pretty far in putting up measures to support small and medium-sized enterprises and cushion them. There's funding that's been available to, um, there's funding that's been available in order to assist during this process and they've been asked to actually make applications to these mechanisms um, and these institutions. There's also um, the unemployment insurance fund that's been made available so that for companies that have taken a decision to lock down, they can claim from the unemployment insurance fund so that workers can get their salaries. But the problem that we have in South Africa is that a lot of employers, frankly, even when business is normal, when you're not dealing with a coronavirus, employers are just not interested in, in filling out paperwork. They just don't care that this is their responsibility and it is their duty to take care of workers. And they're, they've literally just left workers in the lurch. So this for us is particularly worrying because we've been very clear that the kind, that our government should have done this in a different way. We would have preferred, for example, if, if, if they had given um, a, 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 an, in, an income grant, right. which was given directly to families. This would have been much more effective because you wouldn't have a situation which we have now where during lockdown, uh, our officials at NUMSA are running around desperately trying to help workers, trying to make sure they get their salaries because they're dealing with hostile employers who simply couldn't be bothered to assist workers with this type of thing. Right. So from the government side, there hasn't been any concept of direct transfer of either cash or say other essentials such as food. Have any policies been announced in this regard? Well, there are some initiatives uh, around food parcels where um, provinces, for example, have been going on these campaigns house to house um, where they've identified um, indigent and poor families and they're delivering food parcels. So that, of course, is progressive. But if you're talking about a huge sector of the population where, where, where the problem comes is for workers who are either casual workers mm -hmm. Uh, and, and and don't fall part of the system because indigent families are already families that are exist on a system right and our government so in other words if you're not on that system already you're not going to benefit from food parcels if you're an independent contractor or a freelancer or a casual worker chances are you're not on that system so you're not going to benefit and it's all of those groups of workers that are finding themselves having problems it's workers who are working for small and medium sized companies who are suffering. A lot of bigger companies have taken um, decisions because of reserves and also because of support from government. They are paying. But what we needed was something like along the lines of guaranteed income mm -hmm. as a directive from government. Which is We're one of the demands, which is one of the here. demands NUMSA has raised on. Precisely, right. precisely. Um, it is too much reliance on the goodwill of capital. And that is where, uh, uh, where a lot of our problems are. The fact that, for example, that our government has not taken the, the most crucial decision, which is to nationalize the private health care, right. means for us that they're not actually dealing with this effectively. They're not taking this seriously. South African health care system has effectively collapsed. Our public health care system collapsed long before coronavirus came on the scene. We have the most, our hospitals are completely underfunded, they're understaffed, drastically under-resourced. Chris Honey uh, Baragwanath Hospital, which is the biggest hospital in Africa, um, frequently runs out of, you know, Panado, uh, you know, painkillers. Right. Uh, it's it's that bad. So how how are we? How is it that we can then say we are preparing for coronavirus, but we're not doing the most obvious thing? which would be to take over all the private healthcare uh, facilities in our country. Um, our healthcare system is very skewed in the sense that all of the specialists, all of the best resources, all of the best hospitals target and cater for the minority who are wealthy, who have medical aid and can access these things, not more than 26% of the population. The rest must take their chances in, in the public sector. So, what we're, we feel that that is a fundamental failure 
in the strategy because it means that we are actually not going to be able to tackle this virus. This is made worse by the fact that health workers do not have access to health, um, to PPEs, to safety clothing, um, masks, um, uh, gloves, all of those things. And we know, um, based on scientific evidence, how fast this virus uh, spreads. Mm -hmm. Already, several of our health professionals have fallen sick. So, you know, um, we see that our government is not prioritizing this. And for us, as long as they're not prioritizing these crucial areas, then unfortunately, we really are going to be headed for a disaster as bad as Italy, if not worse. Right. So, uh, what are the other key demands that NUMSA has been raising at this point? You mentioned the privatization of the health sector and you mentioned, of course, the issue of the guaranteed income which has to go. But what have been the other demands too? Well, some, um, those for us are, are really the key demands. Um, we've also made demands, for example, around the demands which have been raised by our, our comrades, Abashal Basim Jondolo, ABM, whose movement has been viciously and violently attacked by the Eteguini municipality, which is a municipality located in Guazulu Natal, in the province of Guazulu Natal. Um, these really are the poorest of the poor. These are shack dwellers who uh, live in informal settlements. And during the coronavirus pandemic, our government has been systematically, the, gov the municipality of Eteguini has been systematically destroying these shacks. Imagine during, during a lockdown, They've destroyed shacks. They've, they're evicting people by the dozens. Um, many members of the movement are sleeping exposed to the elements because they've got no ho ho housing. Mm -hmm. um, last night, apparently, they were attacked again and 29 women were arrested. Right. Uh, we find this completely unacceptable uh, and sh shocking uh, considering what we are battling in this time. And it's not just these types of attacks that w I'm talking about. We've had the army deployed in our communities since the rollout. And the army, frankly, has not been pro playing a very progressive role. Um, we would have hoped that the army would have played the role of supporting health workers, mm -hmm. perhaps um, testing on a mass scale to support the health um, sector, uh, setting up makeshift facilities for testing and treatment in informal spaces and in communities but they're not doing that they're busy patrolling the streets and at times they get bored and beat up or assault or harass right. uh, members of the public so um, this for us has been deeply concerning because again it speaks to the fact that we feel that our government is not gearing its focus on um, and, and, and really is not acting in the interests of the majority of people. Right. It seems as if um, the state machinery is being used rather to police the poor instead of resolving what is a crisis for all of us. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so for us, really, these are some of the things that we've been raising because if we're not going to treat the poorest of the poor with dignity and guarantee uh, shelter and clean water, then we are, we're not, there's no way we're going to tackle this virus. Right. And unfortunately, to, to beat coronavirus, you actually have to deal decisively with the socioeconomic conditions at the same time. Exactly. And across the world, there have been quite a few discussions on how society looks like after this crisis, when the crisis ends, that is. And the possibility of a new, say, progressive kind of politics coming into being, which has much more radical demands. So has there been that kind of discussion in South African society as well uh, as this crisis progresses? There has been certainly a, a conversation around that. Um, and you can see more and more that people are, 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 are becoming more conscious about the fact that at the heart of this crisis is the fact that capitalism has privatized something as important as healthcare, And we sat back and we allowed that to happen. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and, and, and capitalism has, is proving that it's completely in, uh, incapable of right. responding to a crisis of this kind. So there are these conversations taking place, but there's also a very worrying um, narrative which is developing certainly from the side of Treasury, where we've heard from the finance minister things like um, structural reform, which he says must take place during this 
this process. Right. Um, now, what we know about our finance minister is that he is extremely conservative and um, like the, the governing party, the ANC, has really been strongly pursuing um, the whole neoliberal agenda. And when when he uses words like structural reform, we, we automatically know that what he means is to privatize even further. Right. Um, and, and, and that really is a bizarre response during such times. Right. Um, you know, during war times, you don't privatize anything. The state takes over everything. And the coronavirus pandemic is like a war. Right. And what we've demanded as NUMSA is a war-like response. We demanded, um, for example, a, a massive stimulus package of the kind that was, um, was devised as a Marshall Plan, you know, um, during those times, there's a recovery plan for the Second World War. We, this is what you need at this time. And yet here we have a finance minister and, 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 a, and a government which seems sort of con uh, more concerned about maintaining the wealth of the private sector. Right. So whilst other countries like Italy and Spain have forced the banks to give families and households debt repayment holidays, our government has allowed the banks to basically decide for themselves whether or not they make a contribution to this right. um, crisis. Mm -hmm. and, and what we've seen in terms of their response is very clearly um, a, a model based on them profiteering off the crisis. So they're offering loans uh, with interest. Right. Um, certainly nothing near to what we've seen taking place in other countries. And, and this for us is a deep concern because... Instead of our government taking a good look at the fact that for the last more than two decades we've implemented this neoliberal macroeconomic framework and it has failed. Right. It has created mm -hmm. the most unequal society. Instead of looking at that and saying this thing has clearly failed, we need to do something totally radical. We need to shift to the left. We need to um, do more from a social welfare perspective. They're actually looking at measures which are possibly going to be even more conservative and are going to worsen conditions for the working class and the poor going forward. Right. Thank you so much, Pax, for talking to us. Yeah,